So the archaeological site that I want to cover today is truly one of the most amazing sites in all of the land of the Bible. And it doesn't get visited very often, mainly because it's in the Palestinian area known as the West Bank. The historical source that we need to use in order to understand this place is the Gospel of John. In John chapter 4, Jesus leaves Jerusalem to travel back to Galilee when he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Verse 6 informs us that Jacob's well was there. From ancient Jerusalem, Jacob's well is located around 41 miles to the north in the valley below Mount Gerizim and near the ancient city of Shechem. Today, Jacob's well and the ruins of Shechem are in the Palestinian city of Nablus. The location of Jacob's well is marked today by the church that has been built over it. John 4, 6 says, Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. You've been traveling all through the country, right? You're going to continue traveling through the country. If there is one place where you can get it the most specific, Jesus was right here. It's Jacob's well. He was right here. Does this well match the text? The John 4 account continues when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus asks her for a drink. Then Jesus offers the woman a drink of living water, to which she replies, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. The Samaritan woman says, of this well, the well is deep. Now just next to Jacob's well and just to the north of it are the ruins from the Old Testament period city of Shechem. And G. Ernest Wright excavated there and during his excavations he also measured Jacob's well and found it to be 151 feet deep. We need to go over how we know that that is Jacob's well. One of the strong evidences for this is this archaeological phenomenon that you find with authentic sites of one thing being built on top of another. And definitely we have this at Jacob's Well. Today we have the modern church built over the well. Um, before that we know there was a Crusader church. Before the Crusader church there was an early Byzantine church. And the mosaic floors from this Byzantine church also have been exposed and can be seen at the site today. This well for a very long time has been commemorated as Jacob's well. And so uh, what has been left behind is the archeology span for that and these stacked layers, one on top of another, pointing to this well saying, this is the authentic site that John 4 is talking about. So the way that these biblical locations like Jacob's Well were remembered over time is through the knowledge of the locals who passed on the location of these sites and what they were from generation to generation. And a great example of how this works is found in John chapter 4 itself. In John 4:12, the Samaritan woman asked Jesus, Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. It's been some 1800 years since the time of Jacob and his sons, and yet we see the Samaritan woman knows who it is that dug the well that she's getting water from. How is this possible? Well, the locals have passed this knowledge down from generation to generation, so that 1800 years later, the locals understand who dug this well. 
I mean, when you're there looking at the well, looking down in the well, it is hard to comprehend. This was dug by Jacob himself, by his sons, the sons of Israel. We have here the reality that the history of this well is retained by the local knowledge and the biblical text all the way from when it was dug by Jacob and his sons all the way to the time that Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman and then all the way to the time where Christians are visiting the site, writing about it and building a commemorative church over the top of it. Now the other thing that helps the locals to retain the knowledge of this well is that they continue to use it century after century after century. In the land of the Bible, the, uh, the need for water is great and so when you have access to that water, then certainly you use it from generation to generation. As an example of this, I was uh, doing a film called The Soul Shepherd, and for this film, I spent two and a half years hanging out with Bedouin shepherds. And so one day I was with a shepherd, and I was in this very remote area, and he stopped to water his flock at this ancient well. I could tell by looking at it that it was very ancient. And so being an archaeologist, I walked around the outside of the well and collected the pottery, which showed that that well had been in use for over 3,000 years. This is the same case with Jacob's well. Uh, it was in use for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It was in use from the time Jacob and his sons dug it until the Samaritan woman came to it to draw water. And then even in the pictures from the late 1800s, we see that women are still coming to this well to draw water and take it back to their families. So if the well would have gone out of use for a long period of time, maybe it would have been forgotten. But because it's connected to these ancient texts, to Scripture, and because it's used generation after generation, the knowledge of that well, who dug it, and uh, what happened there in the time of Jesus in the Roman period was retained by the local knowledge. Now it's important to note that, uh, that the Old Testament doesn't mention Jacob's well by name. However, it does give an account for Jacob living in the area. Genesis 33, 18 through 19 says, After Jacob came from Padan Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. For a hundred pieces of silver, he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. The archaeology is the study of the ancients from what's been left behind. So when reading this verse, what would we expect to be left behind. Well, certainly we would expect the ruins from the city of Shechem to be left behind, and we know where those are. They've been excavated several times. However, it becomes a problem when you're talking about people who lived in tents. Uh, nomadic people living in tents don't tend to leave very much behind. They don't have very much to leave behind. I grew up uh, around Bedouin. I've been around Bedouin for most of my life, and I can assure you that it is difficult to figure out where Bedouin camped a couple of weeks ago, much less 4,000 years ago. And so we have uh, this dilemma. How do you know where Jacob camped uh, 3,800 years ago? Um, he lives in tents. Well, there is an exception. If he and his sons dug a 151-foot hole down through the bedrock to get access to the water, then that would be left behind. And so amazingly, since we know where this site is, Jacob's Well from John chapter 4, we also can connect it back to Genesis 33 and know where Jacob bought this land and where he pitched his tent. It's very significant, this land that Jacob purchased for a hundred pieces of silver, because it is at Shechem that Abram, Jacob's grandfather, first came and at least in the land of Canaan was first promised that your uh, descendants will inherit the land of Canaan. And here we have the grandson of Abram, Jacob, possessing this land, buying this plot of land where he pitched his tent in Genesis chapter 33. And so where is that? It's where Jacob's well would be located. Why? Because you don't buy a piece of land 
put your tents up there with your huge flocks and then go dig a well 151 feet through the ground somewhere else. You would do it at the place at the plot of ground that you bought. When we look at where the location of Jacob's well is, which is given to us because it's under this modern church, and we look at the ruins of Shechem, we see that indeed it fits this Genesis 33 account in that it is definitely within sight of the city. So I want the women to come forward and we're going to get some water out of the well. Go ahead and grab this and just start lowering it. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I see okay. I see it's in the water now. Okay, now bring it the other way. Now you can see that it was no easy task for the Samaritan woman to come here maybe more than one time a day to get water. Uh, she had to walk from her house with this big jar and go down to Jacob's well, lower it down, fill it with water, pull it up 151 feet, put it on her head, would have been very heavy, and then carry it back to her house. And so uh, when she came to the well and Jesus was sitting there, Jesus knew precisely what to talk to her about. And he talked to her about water. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now the thing about uh, shepherds watering their flocks at a well is it's not wearisome for the animals themselves. The animals can't get a drink. Uh, a sheep can't get a drink out of a well. It's the shepherd that does all the work. In order for the animals to drink, the shepherd has to get the water and give them a drink. This is what's happening in the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus is offering her this drink of living water. She can't drink living water on her own. She needs to be offered that drink. Jesus says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Saying when the Messiah comes, he's going to explain everything. And Jesus says, the one that's sitting here talking to you, I am he. And so this is where Jesus offers this drink to the Samaritan woman of living water. And how does she drink it? She drinks it by believing that he is who he claims to be. We can't access the living water. We can't get eternal life for ourselves. We need Jesus to do the work and then offer us the drink. When we come to believe in Jesus, then he pours out the Holy Spirit and we worship God through the Spirit and truth and we have what guarantees the inheritance of eternal life. To dig deeper, you can order a copy of my book, which has been a number one bestseller in archaeology. Just click the link in the description below this video. I hope that you liked this video. If you did, please give it a like. Consider uh, also subscribing to the channel. Uh, some of the footage that you saw comes from a film that I did called The Soul Shepherd. I consider that the, the best film I've ever made. I know people who watch it have a very strong reaction to it. So I would really highly recommend that you watch The Soul Shepherd, which you can do right here. 
And thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.